chapter, your stuff, Genesis 15. <clears throat> and um, I think we'll catch up by going ahead and starting with verse 1, although I think we had, uh, we had actually worked down to verse, uh, to verse 4. <clears throat> Genesis 15, verse 1. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came, came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So... Um, this, this is really, um, <clears throat> this is the first time we've read this through up to this point. Usually what we do and what we did was that we would take one verse at a time and try to go through it and sometimes several verses. But <clears throat> um, I think that these verses show an interesting uh, relationship between Abram and the Lord uh, and between the Lord and the seed that he once brought forth in him, because that's what he's talking about to him. He's talking about a son. He's talking about an heir. He's talking about the firstborn, <laughs> the son, the heir. <clears throat> and um, so, um, but at first he's not. At first he's, he's just sort of telling Abram that, um, <clears throat> you know, after you had sided with me and sided with me in relationship to Melchizedek and those things that happened at the end of 14, um, that he was moved to say that he would be his shield and exceeding great reward. And if you remember then, Abram, uh, his focus was not on great reward or shield. His heart was upon the son that God had promised. And, um, and he was also concerned, he was concerned that he had not gotten that son yet, um, which we, we go through that. <clears throat> you know, where's the son that you promised? Where's the life? Where's, I want more? Where is he? Where is he? <clears throat> Except for uh, we have a little more info than he did because he's now looking to Eliezer of Damascus, one born in his own house, as if he would be the heir, as if he would be the son, as if he would be the one, the one that God's talking about. And God's talking about a completely different son, completely different heir. And I, I fear that um, this happens with us too. I fear that sometimes we're, we're reading his word and we comprehend it one way, but we don't comprehend it his way. We don't see from his viewpoint. We see from our viewpoint. We're, we're more grounded in the earth so much so that our, our thinking, our view, our lives are earthbound and... Um, and therefore troubled. Um, whereas the father, and uh, I believe this is the father, sometimes you can tell if it's father, son, or Holy Spirit. I, I remember some years ago, um, quite a few now, but uh, reading different scriptures and going, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. And then later it would say, and the Spirit said, and then I go, 
that's the father, and you could tell because he's, his emphasis is the son, and that's what he is. That's what he's going to do. That's where his heart is. And so um, that is what I think is going on here. Um, so it, it, it begins kind of on a high note of coming out of Melchizedek um, with God promising blessings and things. And then it's, we, we discussed this, but it was kind of a high note in a sense, uh, again, because even though um, Abram was um, in sort of consternation because the son, as he understood it, had not come forth, um, the high note was that he was still focused on the son. He wasn't jumping up and down and going, oh, thank God, you know, God's going to be my shield, and he ain't your shield, so I'm blessed, you know. You know, regular Christian, you know, <laughs> in the sense of, of just trying to get, get what God will bless us with, when in the heart of the Father, and you see that right here, whereas in the heart of the Lord, he wants to bring forth his son in Abram, in him, and through him through his, being his seed from his very bowels, it says right here. And um, so, but then when, when Abram does that, as I said, he's, he's sort of um, doubting a little more. I mean, really, it's the, it's the first big picture of sort of doubt creeping in um, and sort of um, disgruntled to a certain degree, thou hast given me no seed. Um, and this Eliezer of Damascus is the heir, one born in my own house. Well, um, there's in the scriptures that we read, verse 1 through 6, there's two examples of the word of the Lord coming forth. The first one is the word of the Lord where he says, I will be your shield. He didn't say, I'll shield you. He said, I'll be your shield, you know. And, and this is the relationship that he's wanting with us that, that God, that Jesus can be the I am. I am that. I'm not going to do, I'm not the I do. I'm the I am. And he wants to be this in relationship to us. And, it's, and no matter how many times we hear it, it's hard to comprehend because this realm is all about I do and I want and I need and I, you know, but I am realities are hard to find um, even in Christianity in a certain sense because, you know, I mean, the scriptures go through the many things, you know, that we're, uh, you know, that we are in Christ and and uh, they become almost like a jingle to us. We can quote them, but, but they're, not, they're not I am to us. They're not I am that in Christ, but more importantly, Christ is that to me, because even our wording gives us away. I am that in Christ. Well, actually, no. Jesus is that to you as the I am. And if, and if, we, and if our hearts are attuned to ourself, then our words will give us away, and they do. Um, but if our heart is attuned to him, then we don't easily fall back on Eliezer of Damascus and start pointing to him as if that's the son that the father wants. And so God responds. And so the se this is the second time now the word of the Lord comes. And and he's, he's not going to send him, he's not going to say a bunch of precious promises. You know. He's going to push back. And um, verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir. Okay, let's just stop with that first part, because he does describe after that, and when he finishes the sentence, but we need to see that this is the Father speaking and that he is, you know, I, you know, you just, you know, I can see 
the father talking to you just manifested all this stuff with Melchizedek and this reality and and um, and now you're wandering concerning the seed even though I'm proud of you for at least being focused on it's about the seed you're you're using that focus to point at someone else someone else than my son okay so um, I think it maybe hurts the father a little bit. I, I think it might even tick him off a little bit. <laughs> uh, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. You know, you're looking in the wrong place with the wrong heart. And, um, you know, so, I mean, when I read the word of the Lord came, the thought came to me, Why did the word of the Lord come forth at this time? Um, God's reacting to Abraham's choice for firstborn. It's not a, it's not a pleasant, I will be your shield anymore. In fact, it's almost as if he's saying, I told you just a few minutes ago, I'll be your shield, but I will not shield you from me. <laughs> you know, I will not. I am going to bring forth my son, and you need to understand that. And you need to understand, and, and I think we do, and I think we, we, we I've, I've kind of pressed it a lot lately, you know, like the last 15 years, that, um, <laughs> that, that if you, the way to get on the right side of the Father is want the Son, and the same thing with the Holy Spirit. And you make that your realm. You make that, not this your realm. You make that your realm. The heart of the Father, the heart of the Son, and the heart of the Holy Spirit. And you, you relate to them the way they want to be related to. On the things that is the desire of their heart that they won't speak up individually themselves. And I'll show you an example of that. Well, I'm, I'm, we'll see. Um, but you, you find that motivating factor in them. And it's all related to one another. Jesus came, you know, uh, I think I mentioned this last night or something, but <clears throat> Jesus came to declare the Father. And when they said, well, you know, you did this so-and-so, he said, I didn't do it. It's, the words I speak are not my own. The works I do are not my own. Um, and then John 17, when he wraps it all up, you know, it's, a, it's about the Father and his desire. And I have finished the work while he's talking about doing what he did for the Father, to glorify the Father. <clears throat> And Jesus even said, glorify thou me. We're going, uh-oh, Jesus is stepping out of bounds with this. Glorify thou me with thyself. <laughs> I mean, that's just, just as beautiful as it can be. It's just as beautiful as it can be. If we understand the true realm of that, if it's just a teaching outside of what we are and the way we are and the way we think, it's like, yeah, that's nice, you know. Good job, Jesus. You know, we're not talking good job, Jesus. We're talking about absolute commitment. So, so when Jesus starts, when he starts talking about going away, he knows that he cannot declare himself. And he says that n numerous times. I, I cannot declare myself and will not declare myself to you. Okay, so, so he wants us to know him. He wants us to be in a relationship with him that is where I am, there you may be also. And he's not talking about heaven. <laughs> you know, he's talking about where I am. Where I am not I am. I'm just Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, you know, I don't know that we're going to be together, if you understand that. That not being the point, but the point being the I am, where I am. There you may be a being thing, I am. You may be also. 
And uh, so, um, no, I'm not Catholic. I just, I'm just weird. I don't know why I do stuff. And I don't even do the Catholic thing. It's not even a cross. It's an L. <coughs> anyway, um, so, um, so God is reacting to Abram's choice. You know, this shall not be. This shall not be. Okay. Well, again, it's, it's not his choice that's bothering him as much as his lack of the right choice. You shouldn't be looking there. You already did it with Lot. You know, now you're doing it with Eliezer. And the, and the father in foreknowledge is going, and then there's going to be this Ishmael guy you don't know anything about. You know? And it's like you keep wandering in your spirit and in your direction, though, you know, though you have at least stayed on wanting the seed of my choice, you're, you're finding another choice. <clears throat> And um, so, um, so when he's speaking, when he's speaking to, to Abram, um, he's talking about the heir, and he, but he's, he doesn't have in mind giving us things. His, what he has in mind is to inherit the son, the nature of the son, the firstborn in us who inherits all of the, you know, all of that compared to us. And to honor him as the firstborn is honored. And that, and, you know, just a little reminder, one reason why uh, when I started teaching on the firstborn, I never went to the New Testament to teach it from there is because I think it's all a certain way and when you go to um, uh, you go to uh, Cain and Abel and you see a firstborn arise in the heart of the father one that represents Jesus the firstborn who goes into death Abel and then you see in, in Abraham and then you see a, the process of going and going and going until he gets the son and then then it goes and goes until the son is taken to the altar and then you see Jacob, and then you see Joseph, and you see all the death that's going on, but it's by the life of the firstborn that gives himself. It's not just death. It is glorious selflessness that God raises out of. <laughs> but he doesn't raise out of selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, he doesn't. That's the exact opposite of what he's trying to bring forth of his son in us who will give himself in such a manner that it will glorify the Father. I'll just say it like that. So, um, he's not, the, the real thing that's on the heart of the Father explodes here. You know, uh, you know, this shall not be the heir, but, <laughs> yeah, this, this, but, this shall not, but, okay. So he is ever, regardless of when we go off or we, we think, well, this is what he wants and it's not the son, you know, we say, well, but. You know, in the Old Testament, they did stuff like this. Well, it was supposed to represent the Son, supposed to represent the Lamb. And we're just doing Christian stuff, you know. Well, let's just do Christian stuff. No, let's let Christ be the life of his body. And that life will tend to give himself. <laughs> in his body. Do you understand that? That life will tend to give himself in his body, us. Some of his last words. This is, 
This is my body. This bread represents my body, which is broken for you. Put the broken thing inside of you. This represents my life poured out for you. Don't just pour it over, you know, like syrup on pancakes, pour it over your sins, you know. And go, oh, thank you, Lord. All my sins are pancaked. No. Drink it. Put it on the inside of you. Yes. This is, it's, you know, there's so much on this. And I'm, even the Lord's sharing some good stuff with me right now. But, uh, but that, that was the spirit. This was what's going on. This is, this is his, oh, I don't want to say it because I'm, no, no, I have the right words. I just don't want to go there right now. Um, I don't think the Holy Spirit wants me to go there right now. And I'm with you. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I mentioned, you know, in the, in the verse 1 there that God said that I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. And then I said that he will not shield you from him. He may shield you from the enemy. He may shield you from many things. But he has a straight shot to you. Okay. Yeah. Well, praise God, you know. I mean, come on, you got to picture this picture right here. Um, Abraham's going, thou hast given me no seed, and all I've got is, and he goes, this shall not, you, you, you got to see that picture, because it's like, stop whining and listen to me. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> Did you say praise Scott? Okay. Anyway. Um, so, uh, there's, uh, he's not going to shield you from him. And you know what? He is not going to shield us from our old life. He is going to. So, here's what we want him to do. We want him to take us to the cross in himself. Thank you, sir. Billy Jones, are you here? Billy Jones. Take you to the cross. We want him to take you to the cross. I don't know why I do stuff like that. Uh, and um, put us to death. Rise again and say, I'm your life now. And then come to our lives every day with a shovel and start digging out all the crap that he put to death on the cross already. Oh, Lord, that hurt. Be careful with that shovel. You're, you know, you got to be a little more specific there. You, you're hurting stuff that I don't want to hurt, you know. <laughs> and work on me every day. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to show the reality of Jesus crucified and risen. And you in him, by the way. So that the life you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who gives himself, who, who shows love by giving himself. Do you know what verse that is? Yes. That's the last part of Galatians 2.20. I tricked you. Because <laughs> I didn't say you're crucified with Christ. And you go, I just quoted the life I now live in the flesh based on the fact that I'm crucified. I live by the faith of the one who gave himself, and that's why I'm being crucified so that he can come forth. I'm crucified, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. All right, so every Christian says Christ lives in him, right? Christ, oh, are, are you born again? Yeah. Does Christ live in you? Oh, yeah. Have you seen him lately? <laughs> Not really. 
Uh, <laughs> I know he's in there, uh, but I've been real busy with my own life, and uh, so he's really, you know, he's really hadn't had much of an opportunity to show himself. But I'm pretty sure I've got a big crisis coming up, and I bet you he's going to show up then. See, that's us. We use him. We use him. We use him for our own ends. We use him for a life that should be crucified. We do. You know. Well, what are you saying, brother, that we shouldn't look to Jesus for help in our crises? Okay. Do you really want to know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that all things work together for good, whether they're good, bad, and different, if we want to be conformed to his image. And if we don't, they are not working. See, the, it, it's not just a blanket thing that magically is there all the time for all Christians. All things work together for good. So everything's, you know, everything's just going to be rosy. No. If you want to be conformed to the image of Christ, he's going to put you through crosses. You understand my, my usage there? Things that are going to challenge your flesh. That can actually work to conform you to the image of Christ. You can go up, you know, you can fail the test, and that can help. You can go, oh, my God, I hate myself. <laughs> I just want Jesus. I, I do this all the time. I'm like a, you know, a broken record. You know, I don't know if y'all even know what a, a scratch record is, a, but you, you put it on the thing, and then you put the little needle down, and every time it gets to it, it goes, <laughs> Um, well, our lives just keep going round and round, and we just fall into the same stuff, and we do the same stuff, and we think the same stuff, and we react the same way, and we da 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 da. Okay. We can say, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ, okay? But it's not saying all things work together for good to them who love God or called to his purpose. Um, that they may be conformed to his image, okay? So um, I'm saying that, and theologically I want that, but I'm resisting, you know, half of the things that are meant to help conform me to his image, <laughs> you know? And so we're treating this like, not, not like Christ and crucified, not like the tree of life, not like the cross, we're treating it like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we look at the tree and we go, there's some good fruit and there's some evil and there's good and, there's, and I'm so spiritual because I can tell the difference. You know? And so we go, okay, I am going to, I'm going to really get with the Lord and I'm going to pull off all the bad and I'm going to just eat the good and say, oh, I'm being conformed to his image. I don't know if you know, maybe you don't know this, but did you know that if you pull off all the fruit like that, it grows back stronger? <laughs> I mean, it does. I know that because uh, when, when I lived in the orphanage, we had a bodark tree, which is a um, horse apple tree. And, um, and, and uh, we, there was kind of a ranch. We had to go work on it and stuff like that. Child labor laws weren't in place then. And um, we would, um, and they had cows and horses and stuff. And those horse apples would fall on the ground, and the animals would stomp it. And then, when it rained, they would just be this big messy mush. And then all these flies and bugs would come around it, and everything like that, you know. And I remember one time they said, "Man, this this tree is just a problem. We need to get all the horse apples off the tree." Which, by the way. They have got really big thorns. So a couple of us got up there. We are ripped to shreds afterwards, but hey, we like climbing trees. And we pulled it all off. And I don't remember how long later, but that thing was full 
full. I mean, we're going, oh my God, we created a monster, <laughs> you know. But so, just, so you don't get rid of it like that. You, you go to the roots and you kill it at its root. You don't just start pulling off fruit because it'll grow back stronger. So it's, it's, this, it's this thing of good and evil. And, and so all things work together for good. And our mind is uh, uh, doctrinally sound. But when something comes up, you remember what Peter, Peter said? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you. Okay, well, that's, the fiery trial is the altar. <laughs> okay? That's what it is. Well, I don't want to go to the altar. Again, I, I always think of that, you know, Frank Sinatra. I got to be me. Or New York, New York. Anyway, but that one doesn't count. Um, we're, 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 we formulated the doctrines correctly, but the heart is not pressing toward the mark and for the prize of Christ, the high calling of God in Christ. The heart isn't going, I don't care what comes, Lord, conform me to your image. Use it. Instead of, Lord, remove these things. Remove the things that will conform me. <laughs> you know, take away the things that hurt my flesh, that make my flesh uncomfortable or whatever. There's no growth there. There's no, there isn't. There is no power in the doctrine of Christ and him crucified. The power is in Christ and him crucified. Did you catch that? There is no power in the doctrine of Christ and him crucified. There isn't, there isn't any more power in that than there is, you know, uh, the, the book about Pinocchio. It's just a, it's just a story until it's life. It's just a story. So, okay, so back to Abraham here. God is reacting to all that. We don't even see, we go, well, what does he get so upset about? I don't get that. He's a loving God. He must just, he's just a bad day. You know, just having a bad day. No, he's having a bad son. <laughs> so, it's not about our life. It's not about, it's not about Eliezer. It's not about Lot. It's not about Ishmael. It's about his life. The father's concern is with his life. The father's concern is, are you raising my son properly? You see what I mean? It's like having his child. Are you raising my son properly? Are you feeding him? Are you feeding you? Are you are you covering him or are you covering your flesh? <clears throat> anyway, so uh, let's go to, let's do five and six again, verses. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, so this little phrase here, counted to him for righteousness, first time it was ever used. Um, you know, it's, and, and then Paul picks it up in Romans and in Galatians and says, this is the basis of faith. Okay, so, so I'm looking at that. You know, I'm reading that, and I'm going, that's the basis of faith. Huh? Hmm. That's the basis of faith, is to look at the stars and start counting. <laughs> you know, I'm going, I don't know, that just didn't ring right with me. Uh, first of all, I don't think Abraham could count them all. 
much less me. So it can't be that. <clears throat> so then we say, okay, well, it's got to be the fact that because, you know, Galatians 3.16 says, <clears throat> now, speaking of God, now he saith unto thy seed, not as unto seeds, as of many, but unto thy seed, which seed is Christ. So he's literally quoting from Abraham's situation and the promises that were made, and Paul is flat out saying, it's not how many Jews are going to come out of Abraham. Okay, so we say it is uh, how many people are going to be saved. <laughs> you know, so that's it. That's the faith. We've got to believe people are going to get saved. Well, okay. Have, have you ever saved anybody? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, anyway, so, so I'm looking at that and I'm going, okay, yeah. But Abraham's reaction was that he believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. Because he believed um, that a whole bunch of Jews were going to come forth or a whole bunch of saved people come forth. And so I remembered a scripture in John. So if you want to turn there with me, it's um, John chapter 8. Keep your place there in, in uh, Genesis. But John chapter 8, starting at verse 56. And this is Jesus speaking <clears throat> uh, in verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And then said the Jews unto him, Thou art yet 50 years old. Hey, what do you mean 50? He's like barely over 30, <laughs> you know. I mean, if he was some of us, he'd go, hey, I'm a lot younger than that. <laughs> yeah. And hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what does he say? I am. My Lord, folks, I'm telling you, he's not saying I was. He's not saying, I was around, I was alive, I saw it, I know it. He's saying, before Abraham was, I am. I always am the I am, and I need to be that to you, but you Jews are fighting it every step of the way, and they are. That's what this is all about, you know. And uh, I think it's even just above this where he says, you're, you know, you're of your father the devil. But he says that because... They don't know Jesus' father. And Jesus is trying to explain his father. And this is a whole argument, as it were, if you can call it that, uh, pertaining to the father and the son. And that's the way I started seeing this, was that it wasn't about how many Jews or how many Christians would be saved or even how many Christians would have Jesus in them. Ultimately, it was about the father's grand view and glorious reach pertaining to his son. If you can count that, then you can understand my heart for my son. All right. Now, if we could see that, if we could see that the way Abraham did and saw what? Saw his day. Okay. And the way that that day had dawned in the father's heart. And he's just going, this is... That's the seed. Because he saith not as unto seeds as of many, but one. That's what Galatians 3.16 says. So it can't be many. It's one. And you, we say, okay, well, it's one in each one of us. Yes, that's true. And if each one of us would literally bring forth the son instead of Christianity, well, that would be more effectual. Because once you put it in as Christ coming forth in somebody, you've reduced the amount of stars you got. Well, there's a five right over there. <laughs> you know, I'm just joking. But, you know, but I believe that what moved Abraham or Abram's heart at this point to believe was he believed in the Father's 
um, um, view and what he desired concerning his son, and it was so vast and so big and so glorious that now he can believe that you're going to do this thing because I'm seeing your heart, and it's really big concerning your son, and that's what I'm asking for. Does that, does that make sense? That's a big deal. I mean, yeah. Oh, good. did, but I mean, may I say that in seeing that in God, God says, come here, <laughs> you know, so shall thy seed, he saith unto him, seed, not as of many, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just showing you right here, he said, You're, so shall thy seed be, and Paul saw that as he's talking about one seed. Now, even if that is the, the reality of Christ being manifest in us, in the Father's heart, it's not many. It's just one seed in all of us. But as Jennifer was saying, this, and that's what I was, I was saying, this must have moved his heart. Because remember, he was just doubting just before this. And he's going, you know, uh, well, you know, you have given me no seed. And then he's seeing the father's heart in relationship to a son. And as far as he knows, it's the son that Abraham's going to bring forth. And he goes, whoa, and you're this committed? You're this wowed by him? Then I don't think I have to worry on that front. Now, we're not going to get in it into tonight, but he will come up with another question right after this, and that question relates to how is that going to come about? Because that's us. That is so us. That's the way we are. It's like, whoa! I, and see, and as the scripture says, and he believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How's this going to come about? <laughs> I was just going, Abraham! No wonder I'm still calling you Abram. <laughs> but it's, we're constantly challenging the father's heart over his son and don't know it. We are. We're constantly challenging that because we're so down here. We're so, well, how do I know this is going to happen? And it actually ended up being a great question, even though I don't believe his motive was right. It ended up being a great question because how... Not just what, who, rather, but how is a real key to the whole thing. But, so, um, so let me read this uh, scripture again, and then I want to read just a couple of sentences that I've put down here. <clears throat> and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. <clears throat> All right, so he is, it's like, you, you know, again, remember, the Lord was a little myth. This shall not be. Okay? This shall not be. And so he takes him. He takes him. He brings him forth abroad. And he said, now you quit looking at the earth. Look now towards heaven. Look now towards, uh, as it were, celestial things rather than the earth. You know, the first man is of the earth earthy. <clears throat> so he's saying, get your eyes off of this, this, you know, area of just thinking in terms of the, the sun in your heart, in your mind, in your desire, in your, you know, 
And, and see, this is one of the things I keep telling y'all. Stop it. You'll never have the same view that the father has of his son. So step over here in his heart, his view for his son. Get, say, I want to see as you see, not, um, yeah, I, I see this. And it's really, really big. This is amazing. Well, he's still going, you know, you don't see, you don't see hardly anything yet. I mean, you know, Paul said, well, you know, nothing yet as you are. I mean, I had the Spirit of God speak that to me, you know, pretty young, but he spoke that to me. He said, you know nothing yet as you are. And I said, I kind of got my feelings. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, you didn't say I don't know nothing. <laughs> yes, I hope I've grown a little more since then. So that's another example of the stuff he has to put up with, with us. <clears throat> Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, and if, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it counted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> okay. So I like the phrase, he believed in the Lord. Because it didn't say he believed in the stars or he believed in the concept that was communicated by the stars. I think this supports my view that, or at least what I think happened was that Father Abra, Abraham was moved by the Father's heart toward his son, which he perceived to be the one that he wanted to bring forth through him. And he was so moved that he believed in him. He believed in the Lord. See, that's, that's, here's the difference. Here's the Lord with his view and the, all the greatness of, of his heart for Christ. Here's us with our view and a few encouraging words that make us go, oh, praise God. You know. Most of the time, that's not believing in the Lord. That's believing in the moment. That's believing in the touch. That's believing in the word of encouragement. That's not believing in the Lord. You know that because we go right back to, you know. But when he saw the vastness of his heart toward one seed, his son, he had faith. Not that in the son, as it were, even. He had faith in the father's heart to bring forth that son. So I wrote, this is not what he will be. This is not what uh, Abraham will be. He's looking at that, and he says, so shall thy seed be. So Abraham's not going, oh, well, what about me? <laughs> he wants the son too, right? Not as much as the father yet probably never but he does want the son so and he doesn't want it to be about himself because that's why he was saying you under me you've given no seed you know so it's just me <laughs> and, it, and it's not fun <clears throat> um this is not what he abraham will be he wants it for the seed he wants all of this to come about for the seed and the father was so convincing concerning his son. It is this area that stirred Abram's faith. That the father was so convincing concerning. It's like, I mean, I, I, know, I know, but I, I picture, because it says he, he brought him abroad, like he, he was there with him, and he took him to a certain place, maybe where you could see more stars, you know? and. And, um, and, and while he's talking, he's so convincing of his vast heart and love for his son that all of this, all these stars, we call star, many stars, well, we call stars suns and planets, we don't call them suns. So all these stars are suns. And he sees one sun. 
He only sees one son. Whether he's looking at you or me, it doesn't. It's the son. It's the same son. And he, he, the vastness of his heart at that moment that Abraham's like standing. So I, I believe he did look up there, but I think he's looking right over here. He's believing in the Lord. He's looking at the Lord. He's looking at the Father, and he's going, my God, this is God. And he's saying, you're getting an idea of, you know, you call them sons, I call them the son. You know, Christianity many times says we're sons. Well, we are, but we're sons by Christ. One son, always that. If there's many sons, we're sons by one. And that's the best way. That's the best way because that's the one he wants. Okay, so. Um, and then I just broke off part of the sentence and said, um, Thy seed be, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So the Lord that he believes in, who is giving this vast display of reality in, of his heart, when he sees that he believes in the Lord, in the one who's there with him, he says or he does, I count this to you for right standing with me. This is count, this, this. <laughs> this is counted as right standing with me. This is what I call right standing, being in right standing with God. Honoring the son of my heart. Not honoring the son of your theology, your doctrines. Honoring the son of my heart. And I count that as right standing with me. Now, we will, you know, we've got a long way to go still in Abraham and in the story. But we will see this subject come back up again. And it will be really expanded. It'll be really expanded. In other words, the fullness of what Abram glimpsed in the father's heart is going to burst on the scene eventually. All right, so um, let me finish with this then. Uh, again, John 8, I'll just read it. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Oh, man. And he saw it. Because I'm the son that, that he saw in the father's heart, that he saw in the stars. And he rejoiced to see my day and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. I am. Okay, so. Um, I am is a state of eternal being. The only true place we can understand that or grasp that is in the heart of the Father. Because it's always I am in his heart. That son always is the I am of his heart. It never changes. It may change with us. It may change with, with church doctrines and church denominations and whatever, but it never changes in the heart of the father. Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones. I thought this was funny because then, then took the... The father, Abram, abroad to see the stars. Here he's talking about the same situation. Then took the upstones <laughs> to kill him. We're saying the very thing that was counted as righteousness, right standing to God. Then took the upstones to cast at him, and Jesus hid himself. And he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so there's... So there's that thing again, Jesus hiding himself. He reveals himself to those who are 
who who want to see him the way he is. Okay, so want to see him as it is in the heart of the Father. Um, that's what he wants to do. He, do. he does not want to be hidden, but he has to hide himself from those who don't see him in the right light. Um, what, under babes, you know, he, he reveals himself. And went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. And, um, and I'll end with this. There was, um, <clears throat> I was, I was just reading through the Gospels, you know. It's, it's nice to have the Holy Spirit because I'll just read something and uh, I don't have to go, oh, I gotta get this or I gotta, you know. It's like, you wanna show me the sun so I know you're gonna snag me, <laughs> you know. If we, if we would only get that in our heart, we wouldn't be so frenzied. We would go, okay, your heart. I see it. I see the stars. I see the vastness. So I'm trusting in that. So I'm just going to read, and you hit me when you want to. But you have to be with that heart. You can't be with your heart for him. Oh, I really want you. I really want He's going, yeah, you're really wanting to is about this much, you know. <clears throat> um but I, the thing that I noticed, and the reason why I brought this up, was that uh, he went out of the temple. And I started noticing a lot of places in the Gospels where they're trying to get him out of the temple. You know, I mean, he goes in there and he starts driving people out, and then they try, uh, we've got to get him out of here, you know. And then I realized we're supposed to be the temple of God. And there are people who stand up against the reality of Christ in you being the hope of glory. You just be a Christian or something like that, you know. And I went, wow. Wow. They rejected the I am and he's out of the temple because they're picking up stones. They drive him out of the temple. And then I, my final thing uh, I wrote, here is an Old Testament character living in New Testament reality. <laughs> I love it. I do love it. David did it. Did it. <sighs> Father, we come to you in the name of your son. We come to you in the name of his desire to be all and to be the fulfillment of all that you desire in us and of the Holy Spirit's desire to make that practical and real in our lives. And, and we come not based on our love, but your love. Not our love for Jesus, but your love, Father. Your love, Holy Spirit. And we, we ask to know him, not because we are great seekers, scholars, or, or spiritual men and women we ask to know him as you know him for your glory for your glory and it'll bring glory to Jesus and you father and the Holy Spirit so we're we are genuinely father trying to move away from making this about our state and we are coming to you based on your state, your status. You are made unto us righteousness, right standing, wisdom. You are the way, not we're going to stay in the way or walk in the way or whatever. We're, we're moving from us to the I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am your peace. <clears throat> I am the vine, true vine. I am the good shepherd. We're moving from us. We're moving as, as it were by your grace and by the, the great desire of your heart into the things that you care about and the things that will be to your good pleasure as it, as it states in Ephesians, that all this could be from our side for your good pleasure. Even though you're working, 
for one another and us because that's the way the Godhead works. We, we want to enter the spirit of that and stop focusing and always coming to you for ourselves. So thank you. Be blessed as you continue to move among us and be blessed to open our hearts and our eyes more. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.